Hey, before we begin, of course, thank you for the downloads, the stream, the subscription. I hope to Sam Roberts Wrestling Podcast. You can get us every week on iTunes, Spotify, wherever you get podcasts from. The, but the best place to get it from is Stitcher. And the best way to get it from Stitcher is through Stitcher Premium. Go to stitcher.com slash not Sam and sign up for premium using that URL Right now, what you get is this podcast every single week, completely commercial free. You also get every other week, every other Monday, a special bonus show called Sam Roberts Wrestling Podcast Captive Audience, where I take somebody, could be my wife, could be my dad, could be Troy Kwan, my coworker, he's on the newest episode, and I, I hold them captive in the Not Sam studio as we watch a wrestling show of my choosing. We've done uh, Royal Rumbles. We've done spring stampedes. We've done uh, in your house mind games. We did over the edge ninety eight. That's the most recent one that I did uh, with my coworker Troy Kwan. You can listen as we watch the show in real time. I'm watching with a non wrestling fan, so I'm trying to explain the who, what, where, when, and why, the context of everything we're seeing, and why. I love wrestling as much as I do, and we love wrestling as much as we do. You watch it along, you can put it on on the network, and you can listen as me and somebody who is completely unfamiliar with the show provide the soundtrack to what you're watching. It's only available at Stitcher Premium by going to stitcher.com slash not Sam. Sam Roberts Wrestling Podcast, captive audience. Now let's get ready for another great episode. Ladies and gentlemen... Welcome to Sam Roberts Wrestling Podcast. Introducing your host from New York, here is Sam Roberts. Welcome to a very special live from the West Coast edition of Sam Roberts Wrestling Podcast. And you're sitting there saying, uh, how is it live it's a podcast. I'm downloading it whenever. Well, the reason it's live is because as I record this, we are approximately 75 minutes away from when this podcast is usually posted. Uh, but we do what we do with our time on this planet. I'm out here on the West Coast. Uh, I'm in Los Angeles, California. We're doing shows for Sirius XM, Jim Norton and Sam Roberts, the morning show that I do. And You know, I'm sitting here going, I'm not going to not do a wrestling podcast. You know, Sam Roberts Wrestling Podcast. There's three things in life that are guaranteed. Death, taxes, Sam Roberts Wrestling Podcast. Also, the stuff that happens after you eat at Chipotle. All guaranteed in life. But those are, I guess, four things. And that's it. That's it. But I'm telling you, it's another week. It's another Sam Roberts Wrestling Podcast. And I decided that instead of sitting here and going, oh, my God. I'm in Los Angeles. How am I going to do a show? It's going to be very, very easy. Because what I'm going to do is, uh, number one, use hotel Wi-Fi. That's really going to be clutch here. But number two, reach into that West Coast Rolodex and say to myself, Sam, who would your podcast listeners love to hear from? And I realized that my friend Skylar Aston, who has been on the show before, um, and told us a great story, would love, or, or, or is here in Los Angeles. And I reached out to him and, and asked him if he wanted to jump on the podcast with us this week, and he said he would love to. Now, when Skylar Aston was last on the show, he told a story about um, being in a hotel as a small child, and the maids threw out all his wrestling toys because he used a garbage can as a ring. He wanted to do a battle royal with all his Hasbros. And so and he was out on vacation with his family. His whole story is on the podcast. You can go through. It's probably a year ago or so. He's doing his battle royal in his garbage can. His parents say, hey, little Skyler. Hey, tiny little baby Skyler. It's time to go to dinner. He goes, okay, let me just put all my guys in my ring. The ring is the garbage can. For some reason, the maid service, I guess they came at night. Maybe it wasn't dinner. Who knows? Doesn't matter. Point is, the maid service came. And instead of thinking to themselves, and this has always driven me crazy, instead of thinking to themselves, oh, there's a garbage can full of amazing Hasbro toys. There is no way that this kid meant to throw out his entire collection of WWF action figures. It doesn't make any sense. No, no, no. They didn't say that to themselves. They said, oh, well, if this amazing collection of WWF action figures is in the garbage can, they must want to throw it out. And so the maids emptied the trash 
It's in the trash can. Whatever's in the trash can. It's almost like vindictive. Like, look, I don't want to be here. So whatever, whatever is in the trash can becomes my property, right? And so they threw out all of his toys. They, his, his parents were great parents. They tried to go into dumpsters. They couldn't believe it. They, they, they contacted the front desk everywhere they could go. They could not, could not, I could not get the toys back. So what did they do? Nothing. Young little tiny baby Skyler went home sad. His entire wrestling toy collection gone away. But... All he had to do was wait about 30 years because it all came to fruition when he got a package sent to his house full of WWE action figures with a note from Stephanie McMahon herself. And I went to his house and I saw the note. I know this isn't a lie. He showed me the note in the box that was sent to him full of toys. He had Ultimate Warrior. He had uh, Macho Man. He had Roman Reigns. He had everyone. And she goes, something to the effect of, I heard you know, that this had happened to you, and hopefully this makes it better. Let me know if you ever want to come see a show, Stephanie McMahon. And it was handwritten, not typed, the whole deal. It was amazing. Not because Skylar Aston got toys, but because that means that Stephanie McMahon is a huge fan of Sam Roberts Wrestling Podcast. Very, very exciting for me. It's a very, very exciting time to be Sam Roberts. So I wanted to share that time with Skylar Aston. I went over to Skylar Aston's house. We sat down in the room where he watches Raw and SmackDown and all of his WWE shows every week, uh, and we chatted about wrestling, where he's at, his fandom, his first experience at a WrestleMania, um, and a whole bunch more about the current day product. I love getting his take on stuff. This is Skylar Astin. He's a... He's, he was in Pitch Perfect. He's been in a whole bunch of movies and TV shows. IMDB him if you don't know him and go, whoa, I've seen that guy on TV before. He's a wrestling fan? Yep. And he's going to talk about it with you right now on Sam Roberts Wrestling Podcast. And now, the Sam Roberts Wrestling Podcast interview. Well, now returning to Sam Roberts Wrestling Podcast, uh, a guy who has become a wrestling podcast regular, I think. I've listened to you on, uh, on the Mass Man Show, on The Ringer. There's been the Mass Man Show. I do the Comedians of Wrestling. Yeah. Have I done anything else? I feel like I've done more. Oh, because I've been a multiple guest. That's yeah, I mean, you've it. done a lot. I've like co hosted yeah, yeah, on yeah, the yeah, Mass yeah. Man. Yeah. That's just like we're going to Skylar Aston for analysis. Skylar <laughs> Aston, man, welcome back. Hey, it's good to be back. Uh, you're my first. You're the OG. You right. got me in the, you gave me the keys to the kingdom, essentially. That's right. And I'm happy to do that. Yeah. I like saying, like, I, I found this thing. Let's open this up and then give it to the world. Yeah, That's I mean, what podcasting's all about, right? It's not like we're we're taking uh, this is this is mine, and we're no. You put it out, and you give it to the world. There's no paywalls. There's no exclusivity. There's no anything. You just give it to the world. Yeah, especially the wrestling podcast community. Yeah, I feel there's t- tons of crossover. It's like, hey, we're all helping each other in a way. Right. Although most people think I'm just here to help WWE because I'm a bit of a shill, but <laughs> well, <laughs> that's neither here nor there. Um, Skylar Aston, of course, first time you were on the show, you told me uh, the story of having all your action figures thrown out by a hotel maid, um, and I got to see not only your WWE action figure collection, we're in your house right now, here in Los Angeles, beautiful Los Angeles, California, but you showed me the note sent to you by Stephanie McMahon that said in the note, I heard that this happened to you, blah, 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 blah. The I heard part was the important part for me because I was like, oh, nice. Yeah, you got a, you got mail. You got action figures. Great. Sure. I heard. Which means. Where else could she have heard it? Nowhere else. Where else? The Sam Roberts channel. The Sam Roberts podcast. The That's wrestling right. podcast. The last professional broadcaster. That's right. Yeah, I, uh, I was very, very excited to see it. So, first of all, do you, now that you're kind of. Way more, because you were always a wrestling podcast listener. You were always a super wrestling fan. But now that you're a more public wrestling fan, right? Mm-hmm. Do you watch it any differently? Do you experience it any differently? I, I do enjoy having a good a good take every once in a while. Mm-hmm. Like I, it, Whether it's on Twitter or it's on a podcast, I do kind of almost feel like I watch it maybe, not like you do because you were obviously on the shows and stuff, but 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 like a podcast host would, um, 
or, or I, I just, I don't know. I, I try to, I try to not enter markdom or smarkdom too hard. I try to like be a tweener. As but you, you still watch more analytically. Oh yeah. Than you would. Well, I feel like anyone, anyone over thirty probably should. Yeah. You know what I mean? Because yeah. there's a little bit of a sense of irony. I, I think that I think that the Smarks probably, especially with WWE, they uh, cannot fathom why certain storylines are going the way they are. Mm-hmm. And and to me, I think you need to be a little aware always that it, that there are segments, especially that are for kids. Right, and, and and if you watch it with that lens, you could really understand the product and not just want the coolest possible storyline ever with twists and turns on every show. That would be ideal, but I think that that would be a different product. Well, being in show business too, you also have the ability to see the business end of it, absolutely, because you've seen the business end of all this stuff before. Absolutely, you know that actually is helpful, and I, I do liken it a lot to storytelling. But then on on a different level. Um, on a uh, yeah, on a, on a, from a business perspective and from a big company, I've worked for big networks and studios before, where you kind of have to serve those masters, and right. they have their own overhead and their own ad sales that they have to deal with. Right. So, what have you? Uh, you were at WrestleMania mm, first time. Was that your first WrestleMania? That was my first WrestleMania. So, have you? As you've become more public with your wrestling fandom, have you just kind of made the conscious decision to jump in head first, or is it just timing? Uh. You know what? That was a really cool situation. So I was at the Andre the Giant documentary premiere out here in Los Angeles, Mm -hmm. and I had no intention of going to New Orleans. I I was going to assume, since I'm from New York, that MetLife next year, 35, was going to be my first time, and it was going to be epic, and it was going to be a culmination. I was going to take all my hometown buddies who we all went to, you know, the SummerSlam 91 with. Uh, But I ran into Stephanie. And uh, I won't say I manipulated the situation because I have the best of intentions, of course. But I was with her and her people, and she asked if I was going, as, as you do. And um, I said, no, I, I was. This is true, by the way. I was supposed to be doing a project, the project got delayed. So I now was available to go to New Orleans. Right. Uh, I did not know. I, 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 I feel uncomfortable just sending an email to her, her office or anything like that just because it's, it's such an obvious ask. Right. So I was like, look, if hey, we're I'm talking. S- I'm, I'm Skylar Aston and I'd like some free stuff. Please. <laughs> like- <laughs> yeah, right. Again. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, so I, you know. Uh, Thank you for the box of free things. I'd like some more. Ex- exactly. Available. Exactly. And by the way, I'll make the letter a little longer. Uh, <laughs> 8 by 11 would be nice. I have a nice. perfect frame for it. <laughs> I'd like to be a different stationary. Yeah. No one has a square frame, please. <laughs> Recta- a vertical rectangle, please. Uh, so so it, it actually worked out. So where she asked if I was going, I said, ah, no, and now it's last minute. I don't think I'm going to be able to make it. So, of course, she gave a look to one of her people and said, hook him up, set him up. So oh. now all I – so literally I'm in the <laughs> – I'm in the movie theater. Uh, it's still not. Uh, there's still, you know, it's like past time, but the the movie's not even playing yet, and I'm booking airfare <laughs> and <laughs> on your phone. On my <laughs> phone. I'm like, I guess I'm going to New Orleans. <laughs> Texting my wife, hey, honey, we we don't have any plans next week. Now, when you talk to your wife, do you go? Uh, you know, Stephanie McMahon from. She asked if I would go, so I can, like. Do you do you kind of shape it in a way where it's like, or or do you just be honest with you? You're like, oh my god, and then she asked me, I'm going to WrestleMania. I'm going to WrestleMania. See, I can't mark out too much in front of my wife because she'll um, leave me. Right. Uh, but I, I, it's not. It's not even like. I don't really have to frame things with her. Mm-hmm. Everything's kind of under the umbrella of, is it another wrestling thing? Okay, go. You know, right. are you going to be happy? And, and, and actually, the thing that was supposed to be delayed, she knew I was kind of bummed about that. So she was like, oh, that'll be fun for you. You get to go. I know you're like only going to be with dudes. Right. You know, <laughs> you're like, you're pro- you're going to New Orleans. You won't step foot on Bourbon Street. You'll right. just be in like convention centers and hotel lobbies. 100%. And I couldn't be happier. Right. You know, so uh, so that was the easiest part. The, the You know, th- then I needed to make sure I had the proper merch set up. Sure. And what am I going to wear? I mean, it's like, this is our Oscars. This is our Met Ball. Now, do you... Yeah, this is the Met Gala. <laughs> <laughs> the theme is wrestling. Right. <laughs> Always. Yeah. I mean, I... So, on Friday, I do Radio Row. And that means they do Radio Row at Access. So if you do Radio Row, you get to go to Access really, really early in the morning. Nobody's there. You get to walk around. It's really cool. But you also get access to, no pun intended, Uh to the Superstore. 
Oh. So you can go right in, and as soon as it opens that day, you can just go right into the store from the convention floor where nobody's on the convention floor. So traditionally, that's always my move is to go from Radio Row right to the Superstore. And every year, it's more and more money being spent, which is ironic because every year I'm more and more – I'm closer and closer to the company. Right. As far you as figure like part. maybe someone will throw you a shirt every once in a while for a discount code. I or... mean, I've, no, I've literally gone in with a publicist that's like, I can send you that. I literally have it at my desk in Stanford. Let me send you. And I'm like. But we're in New Orleans. I go, and I, I think I better it. buy it right now. <laughs> 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 I, think, I think I should really buy it right now. The line must, the lines blur so much, especially when you're immersed in it the way you are. Right. And the way I've had the fortune of being where you're like still such a fan. I mean, we're at that after party and it's just like, I just want to go up to Seth Rollins and be like. So Grand Slam, huh? But that's the, la- that's the last thing he wants to do. He's like, just like, I just want to eat. Right. You know? So I, I, you know, I manage myself a little bit. Pretty cool. I yeah. see title, huh? <laughs> yeah, right. Mr. Perfect. <laughs> like, Come on. I don't want to yeah. have this conversation He's like, with you. No, I know. I've yeah. been, I celebrated with my people already, and right. now I'm eating. <laughs> Which this used to be just my people. I'm not 100% sure. Right, right. Have the rest yeah. of you... Got him. Mm. There, yeah. There's that line of guys that you're with that are all in single file, and you're just staring at me. <laughs> well, why is that? This isn't a signing. Yeah, this, this is actually me. This is my private place. Right, right. Well, I, I got in. <laughs> <laughs> Where's your wristband? Don't worry about it. I don't have one yet. Yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll find one. Yeah. Don't you worry. I just won't go to the bathroom for four hours because I cannot get back into this place. Right. <laughs> was that the deal? I, yeah, I don't know how I got into that one. Well, I was staying at the Talent Hotel, which was great. Uh, they, they... That, so my first time at the Talent Hotel was WrestleMania 30 in New Orleans. Oh. It was a different hotel, and I had gone because uh, X-Pac was like, do you want to come to WrestleMania with me? I was like, yeah, yes. And so, and he was like, okay, this is the hotel. Just you, know, you still have to book it and pay for it and everything, but it's just like that's the hotel you get to stay at. And that first year, I think this was, the f- this was probably the first year – at that hotel where I haven't felt like at any moment somebody's going to grab me by the shirt collar and throw me out the window. Like, like or, or, or get to the door and like Uncle Phil to Jazzy Jeff on Fresh Prince, just like out. Out. You have no business here. Just completely. Yeah. And by the way, I was grabbed by the shirt collar, but in a totally different way. Mm-hmm. So I was with Mr. Peter Rosenberg. And yeah, I uh, mean, if you don't if you don't want to get grabbed by the shirt collar, he's not the guy to hang yeah, out with. Yeah. I mean, but, we, but the guy was, can't handle himself. Yeah, it, would, it, <laughs> it, it, it was weird though because because there was this part of it's like where I had eaten breakfast that morning, but now it's roped off, and Roman Reigns is sitting with the Usos, and sure. there's like a hole, and and I'm seeing like the Game of Thrones of the WWE, and just who sits with. I mean, it was the coolest cafeteria ever, <laughs> um, and there's alcohol involved. So uh, it was interesting because, yeah, there's like the lobby bar, but then there was like uh, another section. Well, you know, because that's where I saw right. you. So they were pulling this stuff at the at where you couldn't – there was just no more tables. It was actually like a fire hazard. It wasn't even like a WWE exclusivity thing. It was right. literally like there are too many people in this little restaurant. Um, yeah, and there's walls and doors. Yeah. Like people won't get out. Right. So I was just, you know, liquid courage, but also I was with – Peter and we were joking. I was like, "Oh, I will go full on Nash and Hall right now and just hop the barricade if the if, you know, it's the proper situation." So, he uh I think Paige said hi to him, but there was there was a literal like 3 foot, maybe 3 and a half, 4 foot railing. Um and I uh uh it was off to the side so the, the security couldn't see me, and I was like, "I'm going for it." I mean, I mean, I mean, Peter seeing Paige. I don't know who I know in there. I must know people. And uh, I was kind of straddling the thing, getting over. And then out comes Nia Jax. And she takes me by the shirt. Co- <laughs> I've never met Nia Jax before in my life. And she helps me over. And Peter's just a little bit shorter than I am. So he had a tough time as well. But he had like, I don't even know, probably a tag team help him out. Um, just the Usos helping. Uh, and... And she, yeah, she helped me out, not even knowing me, but she knew I was with Peter, so she knew. And she's talking to me, and, you know, we're having a nice time because I'm, I'm, you know, uh, uh, yeah, I'm friends with Peter, yeah. And then she realized um, she's a big Pitch Perfect fan. 
and she not realize. Which is helpful. Yeah, always <laughs> yeah. in those <laughs> in those situations. I, you know, I I never want to like um, go in business for myself, but like at that time, you kind of almost want to like refresh them. It's like, hey, you haven't uh, seen any acapella movies yeah. lately, have you? you ever watch uh, the Breakfast Club in yeah. a dorm room on a bed? <laughs> right. You know, you know, because I mean, I've done that in a movie. <laughs> yeah. um, but it was actually really, it was like a total uh, 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 incredible moment because Naya was just very reserved and very nice and talking and just, you know, who is this friend of Peter's? And then she realized her eyes went wide. She grabbed me again by the shirt collar and literally lifted me off my feet and went, oh my God, you're the guy from Pitch Perfect. I know exactly who you are. And then it was just a big thing because then a bunch of wrestlers, heads are turning around, like what's going on? It's a scene and now I'm... Now it's but that's got to be great though when somebody expresses fan interest in you. Right, you're like now I can be a fan. Yeah. of you exactly, and now, now we, we can join the mutual admiration society. Uh, that's where I love to live. Right, uh, especially with these people. Right, I have no interest with any other. You're almost at the point now where you're doing film and plays so that you have something that a wrestler could be a fan of. As yeah, absolutely. Every time I book a job, it's like, well, great. Now I can go to Mania next year. <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully this one will get picked up so yeah. then people will know I'm still a famous actor of some sort. Well, yeah. I mean, the last thing you want to do is have the career dry up and still be that guy sending emails to Stephanie like, hey, remember yeah. from before? And she's like, Pitch Perfect was a long time yeah. ago, my friend. They did the three and that was that. Yeah, my kids <laughs> grew up. They're now, they've outgrown you. They don't care. Right. <laughs> You're no. not doing any cool Netflix shows, are you? Right. No. Those uh those Teen Choice surfboards, they are they're not uh they're not coasting in anymore, are they? <laughs> yeah. Here you can't even surf on them. Uh, <laughs> just my whole career is diminished by by W. That is the low point. That's that is the low point. But yeah. that's that's still far off. No, no, I got a couple good years in right. me left I think until so I too. So what what struck you about your first WrestleMania experience? Oof. I mean now you had a very different first WrestleMania experience just because, you know, you were you got you were it was so much more intimate for you. You got to be so much closer than most fans get. But still, as a lifelong fan, this is your first WrestleMania and they're now so much bigger. Right. Every year is bigger. Look, I mean, there, there's, of course, like, cool things of, like, riding an elevator with Killian Dane and, you know, things like that. But really what I love about and, – and by the way, New, New Orleans is such a gimmick town to begin with. Mm -hmm. There's, like, a real voodoo element. It's, sure. You know. Um, Everybody's kind of in character anyway. Exactly. Right. However, when I'm walking down the street and there's just a Bret Hart – not Bret Hart. But like a Bret Hart right. in full gear walk in and he's doing the whole, you know, entrance and you're like, this is my Disneyland. Right. I mean, I mean, it's so funny because I figured I learned that at WrestleMania 30 on when we went to New Orleans. It was like it, it was just watching because people go like, oh, did you go to Bourbon Street? And you're like, like you said, your wife, like he's not going to go to Bourbon Street. Even if you were to go to Bourbon Street. It's just WrestleCon spilled out onto Bourbon That's Street. All it's it is. just a bunch of guys either in cosplay or in wrestling shirts. Absolutely. Having a good fun. Like, at any moment, if you went to Bourbon Street during WrestleMania weekend, you'd hear a Rusev Day chant. Oh, there was Rusev Day chants everywhere, first of all. Which yeah. was, I mean, that guy could not be more over. And uh, especially that weekend, my God. And, I mean, I was just having lunch. And, and, and the bar next to us is only playing wrestling themes as their music. So they you know. can only imagine... This it was it was it was great on so many levels. Right. Yeah, it was cool to be immersed with the people and the talent, but it was almost more fun to hit the streets as a regular totally. person, uh, uh, put on some some ridiculous merch. No one knows who I am. They just they're giving me high fives or two sweets because I'm wearing an awesome you know right. uh, you know some some cool merch that I got. And like you could like getting to watch the show in the crowd is like the best. I never wanted it to end. And by the way, I mean, we could talk about the matches and the main event, but I was one of the few people that was actually slightly annoyed at the beach balls and the and the Rusev Day chance. In the main event. And the CM Punk chance. Yeah. I, I mean, it, it overtook me, and then I could no longer enjoy it because it was just like, oh, God, this is wow. It, it was really uh, oh, bizarre. Which is really similar. The last time I saw that, I went to WrestleMania 20 at Madison Square Garden. That was my first WrestleMania. And I remember... The Brock Lesnar-Goldberg match, I was 20 at the time. The Brock Lesnar-Goldberg match was far and away the first time I had ever watched performers not be able to perform 
because of what the crowd was doing. Like, that was the first time. You know, you always hear, you know, a, a crowd not going. You know, 96, I was at Survivor Series when right. Sean's getting booed. And right. Blah, blah, blah. But, like, and that happens. Sure. But it's so rare that the crowd completely takes a match away from a show. Yeah. And it happened at WrestleMania 20. Mm-hmm. And it happened at WrestleMania 34 in New Orleans. I was in front of uh, where the hard cam is. Mm-hmm. So I really got to see Brock's face when delivering F5s. And right, he, because he's pointed at that hard cam. Exactly. And if you're sitting on the same side that the hard cam is, you're seeing what the TV screen would right. be seeing. And so he's not... I mean, you know, and I'm not saying that to say, so it was awesome. I'm saying I was looking at his utter confusion. because Confusion, it, not even anger. Uh, both. Right, but uh, confusion. Confanger. Confusion, which led to rage. Yeah, <laughs> which led to, I'm <laughs> busting you open. Bra- Brock Lesnar is not a guy that I would want to confuse. Like, there are guys that, like, I kind of like to mess with, like, being, on, you know, on the radio. I mean, you people. did ask him what's the haps. He almost headbutted you. You know what? Brock Lesnar is a guy that I like to mess with. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I, I you're one of the only take people. take that back. Yeah. You, you're so right. Yeah. I completely messed with him just because I wanted to see the reaction. Yeah. You're like, well, it'll go viral if he hits this little old Sam Roberts. Yeah. I was, I've was. i always been – I have never minded – I will take one hit from – I could die, but I will, if it's worth it, I will get punched once. I won't do something so awful that it's like, yeah, that guy deserves to get punched. But for the sake of a joke, yeah, for the sake of a laugh, for sure. the sake of entertainment, and I knew in that moment – when Paul Heyman, because Paul Heyman and I, have oh, a West he, the he's the best part about that whole thing, right? When his he goes, look to you, have two questions, and I was like, just to pop Paul Heyman, because I know that he'll be like, no, like that. That was what that whole Brock Lesnar interview was all about. Sure, of course. Just to, just to get Paul Heyman's reaction, right? I was like, I have no choice, <laughs> no choice, because I had my Conor McGregor question in the chamber. That was the real question. Sure. All I wanted was the one. If he would have said you have one question, we would have never gotten the what's the haps moment. Or would we have? I probably would have gone with the haps. Oh, my God. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> oh, my God. Just, <laughs> just because it was so, like, you have one question, Sam. What are you going to do? That's actually even oh, sweeter, right? Really? Right. What's the haps? <laughs> what's <laughs> the haps, Brock? Yeah. Come again? <laughs> just because it, it's the biggest asshole thing you could oh, do. Yeah. It's like, okay, fine. One question, I'll waste it. Yeah. Um, he, but... Yeah, so you see Brock Lesnar, and he's got anger and confusion written all over him. Yeah, because it was it was a bizarre energy. It wasn't the direct like boo in the boo in the baby face kind of a situation. And he's the guy that had felt it before because he it was his match at WrestleMania 20 in the Goldberg match. I didn't think about so that. So part of that rage was probably you guys aren't going to do this to me again because he probably hated that moment, and at the time. It wasn't as because, you know, it's his last match. He's never wrestling again in his head. Like, he's done with this whole thing. And so all that resentment comes back in him, and, and, and they're trying to do it again. But this time, there is a tomorrow. Like, at that moment, he knows he's coming. He's not done. Right. So he's now, like, he can't just say F you to wrestling. Sure. See, do you think that uh, in Vince's head, it was just, hey, we're, we want it, we want it to go down as the best WrestleMania because it, it looked, uh, you know, up until the Rousey match, it, it looked like this is amazing, and then it kind of lost its steam, and then the main event was just a disaster. Do you think that he was going for the? I'm going to swerve them so hard. They're going to think, you know, but what he did not realize was people were already going to turn on it from the second it's from the second Roman came out. It was it wasn't just the booze. It wasn't just like we boo Roman. It was right. the we're turning on this whole event. On the, yeah, on the there on the was match like itself. the there was like there, there, the chance from people like next to me, just like this is this like we want to go home already. I wasn't tired. I could have watched. An hour and a half match. I didn't want Mania to end. Well, the issue with that match was nobody wanted Roman to win, and everybody thought it was inevitability because everybody was sure that Brock was leaving after WrestleMania. Right. Everybody from the smart marks to the guys who just showed up, like it was just in the air. And a year-long build to it, by the way. Right. And by the way, at the beginning of the build, nobody wanted to see it. Sure. You know what I mean? People were like, oh, God, please don't let it be. And then six months in, they were like, oh, no, this can't be. And then when you get there, we're like, I can't believe we're really doing this. Yeah. And, and you know, WWE tried to, I think that's why AJ and Nakamura were on the show. Because it was like, what if we give you this? What if we give you this? In my mind, it was like it was like a relationship where you right. go like, okay, and 
Like, I want to go to WrestleMania on Sunday. On Saturday, we can do, honey, whatever you want. I'll take you to a nice dinner. I won't go to NXT. Sure. We'll take you to a nice dinner. Watch we'll, the Bravo shows. Whatever you, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll take you to a beautiful dinner. We'll go home. We'll watch Andy. We'll do whatever you want. <laughs> <laughs> we'll do whatever you want. But on Sunday, I need you to come to WrestleMania with me. And that's right. the compromise. And the fans, us, we didn't accept the compromise. See, speak for yourself. Unfair. I was ready. Right. I meant the collective. Right, sure, 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 yeah, sure, yeah, yeah, sure. yeah. Yeah, because individually there were those. And I thought I felt the same thing. And I also felt like there wasn't enough from fans. And I've talked about this before, and people have messaged and saying, you know, they don't like that I've said this or whatever. But some people agree. And I think it's true that I think there should be more of an acknowledgement that after the fact – the fans were wrong. We were wrong. If we were booing, if we had this ugh, feeling about this match because we already know how it's going to end, mm. it didn't end that way. No. Like, we were wrong. Like, the reason for the beach balls, the reason for the Johnny wrestling chants, the reason for all that stuff didn't happen. Yeah. Because we do get surprised. And that's why I think I don't mind if Roman wins and everybody just takes a massive dump on it. If that's not what you like, yeah. do your thing. But, that, and that's but also, when it hasn't yeah. happened yet. Mm. Don't dump on it before. Like, let's wait and see what happened. We're in New Orleans. Yes. Last time Brock Lesnar had a match in New Orleans. Right. You didn't see that one coming. Exactly. I didn't see that one coming. So, and 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 it was a similar reaction. Even I was watching the end of the match backstage, and it was a similar reaction in the sense that when Brock beat the Undertaker's streak, the roster, the guys in the back were like, what just happened? Right. What? Right. And when Brock won the title... People in the back were like, what? Really? It was crazy. Yeah. Jaw, I mean, slack jawed. And by the way, I um, am one of the few that I'm not, it's not that I'm a huge Roman fan. I just was, re- I was just ready for it already. And by the way, I would rather have Roman with the belt and we could all boo him and, mm-hmm. and hate it. Uh, rather than Brock holding up the belt, I'm sick of it. I'm I'm done with it. I think he. Needs I was to ready go. for Brock to leave. Yeah, go, go, and 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 go to your ranch. You know, hunt some whatever. Or go to UFC, whatever. You and want then to go to UFC sure, when sure. your suspension's up, and then come back and maybe maybe not a new gimmick, but just a new. You'll breathe new life. Just a into refresh, it. Exactly. refreshment. You know, yeah, no, I I would be fine if Brock left. Um, and I also think that when Brock returned. John Cena needed an opponent. Like, let's keep in mind, when Brock first returned, John Cena had just done two years, pretty much, of building with The Rock, right? That was the big centerpiece of WWE, even though The Rock wasn't there most of the time. Like, really, from WrestleMania, it starts at WrestleMania 27, 28, 29. That two-year period is all about John Cena and The Rock, and that's why WWE is headlines, 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 because The Rock's a big movie star. WWE doesn't have The Rock anymore, so, okay, we got Brock Lesnar back. And it's like, great, perfect, like, this makes sense. We're at a place now where WWE has the star power. You know what I mean? Within the roster itself, add Ronda Rousey is just icing on the cake. Sure. But with Ronda and the entire roster as we see it, you don't need helps. Brock is still a draw. Brock still helps. Brock matches are still... Okay, this is something you got to see. You don't need it anymore, and that's right. why I think it would have been okay for Brock to leave. Absolutely, and then and right now you figure who's the biggest pop right now for a re- not not on the roster, but just as far as a return. It's probably CM Punk is one of your last like big. Oh my God, I can't believe he's that back. could realistically. You know, Stone Cold's not going to wrestle, right? And even honestly, at this moment, I think Cult of Personality would probably get a bigger reaction than the glass shattering. We'll get back to Skylar Aston momentarily, but if you want to have an experience like he did, if you want to check out a show like WrestleMania or any WWE show, any Ring of Honor show, any sports show, whether it's football, baseball, basketball, any concert, any comedy show, a Broadway show maybe, you need to get tickets to go see it. And where can you find the best deals and the best seats? Only at SeatGeek. Matter of fact, all-in tickets went on sale. They sold out in 30 minutes. A lot of you probably missed out. Now you want to know, where is the most reliable place that I can go to get those tickets? Where it can be guaranteed to me that they won't be fake tickets. Also, I want to know I'm getting the best value for the money I put down. Sam, where can I go? It's SeatGeek. All you have to do is download the SeatGeek app on your phone. You search out whatever event you want to go to. If it's all in, search out all in. 
and you can find all of the tickets that are available. It's right there on a seating chart. You can get the best seats that you want, or you can pay attention to the color-coded ranking system that lets you know the value of the seat that you're getting. If you just want to find the best deal, they'll hook you up with that too. And the best hookup of all in terms of value is that you will get $20 off your first purchase. How? By listening to this podcast. All you need to do is enter promo code SAM. That's promo code SAM today and you'll get $20 off your first purchase. Download the SeatGeek app, enter promo code SAM, that's promo code SAM for $20 off your first SeatGeek purchase, and you're going to feel super smart. Let's Speaking of super smart, let's go back to Skylar Aston. In this moment. I'm not saying yes. all the time, but in this moment. Well, especially because the glass shattering is... It's, I won't call it a nostalgia act at all because he's going to drop a couple stunners and it's going to still be awesome. It'll and probably be the best thing on the show. Absolutely. Right. Raw 25 is case in point, best right? Best thing on the show. So, but we just saw that at Raw 25. Exactly. When's the last time we've seen CM Punk in a WWE ring? Right. Uh, that to me is the biggest return. And now- It was headline news when he was just announced as doing an autograph signing yep. at the All In show. Exactly. And that's just the, an autograph signing the day before- at a retail store, pro wrestling tees. Like yeah. that's that's not even going to the ring. That's not right. And and we'll see what happens with his next UFC fight. But I think that he's got about like a year, maybe a year and change left of it being one of the biggest things ever when he comes back to WWE. Well, yeah, because I mean, I don't know exactly how old he is, but pretty soon he's close to forty. Yeah, and right? just and just like the mystery it's like if he gets kind of I won't say embarrassed, but if he loses decisively again in a UFC, his stock goes down just a little bit because then it's like a, well what else is he gonna do? Of course he's gonna come back to Right, and we can't right, we can't feel like that. We can't feel like he's only back because this is all he's got. Exactly. We gotta feel like he's back because he's got something creative to add to this. Absolutely. And 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 uh and it, and it restores hope of like maybe they're going to give him the push that he's always you know maybe he's coming back on terms that are look I'm you know I'm going to do what I wanted to do right and we could at least hope for that in the beginning uh, and I think that really the only person that will get a similar uh, 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 pop as far as a return goes is if Brock went away for a couple of years and we were feeling oh gosh it's just the same roster and oh, who is a uh, I can't think of someone, but yeah, maybe like who is Braun gonna? Who's left for Braun or who's left for Rollins? Well, yeah. If at the, Brock goes away, right? That's what I'm saying. And then he comes back. Now Braun has just destroyed everybody. Brock's the one guy he never beat. And now I'm like super interested in that sure. match, and maybe almost want Brock to re, re, you know reclaim his territory. So, what do you think about the Roman Reigns issue that's going on in WWE right now because it seems to be getting more and more confused uh, as the episodes of Monday Night Raw continue. Um, I said in the, I, I, I think, yeah, in the podcast with Peter Rosenberg, the greatest Royal Rumble podcast, I put out my theory. I posted the video on YouTube because I wanted it out there that to me, Vince McMahon mentally has already moved on from Roman Reigns. He just doesn't quite know it yet right, right you know what i mean like yeah his heart has his brain has and his heart has, <laughs> right. if that makes sense it makes complete sense and to me. that braun and to me it's really clear and i said braun Strowman was a good guy you mm. did and everybody was like you're crazy except He's, me right i think i texted i was like by the way i'm into that right yeah right i was like it's clear to me and like now it's even more th like look when you end your saudi show with him holding up a championship title I'm telling you the only reason that a belt was presented in that Royal Rumble was so Braun could end that specific show for that marketplace holding up the title. And Roman didn't. And that's a big deal. A hundred percent. You know? So, you know, as, as the weeks have gone by, you know, I really, and I talked about this before on the podcast, feel like Roman needs to do a, as a character. So I'm not talking about the man Roman because the man Roman could be handcuffed. Like I'm not the, the, my criticisms of Roman Reigns are not of Joe Anawaii or what, yeah, you know yeah, what I mean? Yeah, like, strictly it's, creative. It's the booking and it's the, the writing. It's the character of Roman Reigns. Right. That's what we're talking about. Right. And I really feel like acknowledgement needs to be made about what's actually going on. Like the idea that he's coming out and complaining every week about getting screwed by management is a little silly to me. And I think that instead, he needs to come out and get way more protective about the fact that this is his yard. And 
Jinder Mahal, who's won once since he's been on Raw, he's lost every match except for one since the Superstar Shakeup. Jinder Mahal is not a threat to Roman's yard. Bobby Lashley's a threat. Mm-hmm. Braun Strowman is a threat. Bobby Roode, how about after Bobby Roode qualifies for the Money in the Bank and Roman doesn't, maybe Roman feels threatened by Bobby Roode. Right. You know, all these guys, these these good guys that fans are cheering, you know, and I think that Bobby Lashley needs to get there a little bit. But if Bobby Lashley were opposite Roman Reigns, it would probably give you a little more to sink your teeth into because, honestly, Sami Zayn is so entertaining. Like, are you really going to cheer for Bobby Lashley over Sami Zayn? Yeah. Probably not. Are you going to cheer for Bobby Lashley over Roman Reigns because Roman is jealous that Bobby is coming in and taking his spot? Yeah. I think so. You're going to pretty much cheer for anyone over Roman. Well, that's, that's paired with Roman Reigns. I mean, Jinder's probably the biggest baby face in the company right now. <laughs> um, and but it didn't help that Roman beat him up and wouldn't even do the match with him. The most, the most heel booking I've ever seen. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> the poor guy is like, oh, I fought through adversity before. He's holding his ribs. He's icing it. He's made, barely making it to the ring and then just get a speared out of nowhere. You hear like, I want Roman to turn heel. And you're like, what else could they do? I mean, he, he, I mean the way he's booked, it is, it is a... He is a heel. Right. And um, I don't want to be a typical wrestling fan and be like, well, they just need to turn him because everyone's been saying that. And I, I have friends. Uh, who I mean, I also think that like that conversation, like if you're going to have that conversation, give me some layers. Like when, sure. when somebody comes to me and just goes like, he should just be a bad guy. But I'm like, what are we talking about? Here? Right. Right. Did you read that on the internet somewhere? Exactly. Like you've not used your brain yeah. at all. Yeah. And we're both two men over 30 talking about Roman Reigns, which happens all the time in the wrestling community. That's of all course. we want to talk about. And and for good reason. So my kind of idea, you know, I think pre-mania talking about, like if someone mentioned turning Roman heel, I'd say, no, you don't understand. Mm-hmm. I, I, you need to go to an event. You need to sit next to a kid who's wearing one of the vests. He's a superhero. He's the Dark Knight. He's Batman to them. Um, however, now with the booking of, of Mania and of the Greatest Royal Rumble and how he complains all the time, and right. now, I mean, he's literally just complained to Kurt Angle, and Kurt Angle told him, look, Roman, so that's the same thing that he's saying to Kevin Owens yeah. and Sami Zayn, which yeah. are some of the biggest heels on the product. Uh, I don't Kurt Angle, see... by the way, not a great GM. No. I, again, character. Character Kurt Angle really is a useless GM. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, I, I, I really... It's not the most original idea, but you do. I do not see anything left for Roman. They're going to literally ruin him if they don't do something that is at least blurring the lines between face and heel. And they kind of are now, but like you said, he needs to acknowledge it. Address he, reality. You can't do the fourth wall and you're pretending the boos aren't happening. No, play to the boos. Oh, right. you want to boo me? You want to boo me? What if he gets... I, this is kind of what you were saying, but maybe more to your point. Like, maybe the most heelish thing for Roman to do is to wa- Roman the character sure want to be a baby face so much that he he destroys every other face which is basically right. what you were saying right like 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 we've we've heard you know and all of it, people know like we've heard Hulk Hogan was always so protective of his spot macho man was always so protective about his spot you know stone cold was protective about his spot stone cold and the rock actually hated each other because mm-hmm. they were both going for the same spot every reality-based wrestling story when you're talking about the main event is all about you hear stories about john cena being protective of his spot and cm punk was mad because he wanted the spot Mm -hmm. but we don't get storylines based on guys who are actually vindictive and jealous and fighting other people because they want that spot. And his gimmick lends itself to that. Yeah. I know they don't like those kind of work shoot ideas, but give me a break. They got, well, actually, now is the time for work shoot promos. That's yeah. all they do. And he literally has a shirt that says, it's my yard, which is another word for spot. Exactly, 100%. So, so to really lean into it as you're talking about turning him with layers, I think it would be fascinating if he actually, I mean, I always kind of want wrestlers to use words like all you marks or whatever. I I, I just love that idea. I don't think we'll ever get him. I don't think we'll go that far. No. But I think the word spot can be used. Spot and, and, and cheer. Like, why don't you cheer me? You cheer him. Right. Why do you cheer? You know, uh, uh, um, uh, better. We well, do better, more nuanced writing than that, of course. But, but the that, idea no, totally. being, like, why don't you cheer me? You boo me. You boo me. You cheer him. Well, when he's walking up to a match the way Ginger was the other night, 
I'm going to spear him into a wall. Right. And he starts taking out the roster, so much so that you can even have a <laughs> segment where you just like see a locker room full of people who are all wrapped up in bandage just from Roman attacking them. Which is similar to what Braun used to do, right. which is then why Braun and Roman becomes a natural fit. And even though we've seen it before, now it means and their something chem- different. And their chemistry is Great. second to none. And then you really get to have a, a major match. And, 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 and over time... You will start to kind of love Roman. You Be, will. I think so, too. Because, by the way, kids also love Braun Strowman. Kids also love AJ Styles. Kids will absolutely love Bobby Lashley in the right circumstance. Right. Like, there's, there's, it's not like Roman... Kids love Seth Rollins. Oh, yeah. You know, it's not like Roman is your only guy that you can get kids. Kids also buy AJ Styles vests. There are some... Absolutely. He's not the only one selling vests, is the point. That's true. <laughs> yeah. I see kids with those gloves, too. Right. Loving it. Right. Um, yeah, you might, his sales might go down briefly, but I think the return would just be, uh, yeah. And and I don't, I don't think it's even like, I mean, you don't even address now I'm turning heel. Like it's not that sort of, it's, it's more like we just said, nuanced in the sense that the same character is progressing in the same way. He's not going to hit someone with a chair, chair. right? It's not the Rollins or even the Nakamura low blow. Precisely. It's. Roman addressing what's been going on around him for the last, you know, two years, three years, but now is becoming a real problem. It's different. And I said this after Backlash that it's one thing to have booze. It's one thing to have disruptive chance. When you go to your victory shot, Roman gets his pin over Samoa Joe, and you pan out and you go to the crowd— and the first thing you see, and they got right off of it, which is good, mm-hmm. but for a split second, the first thing you see is people stand up, turn around, walk out. Right. Like, just leaving. Like, okay, finally we can leave. I don't care. That's death. Like, mm-hmm. there's no spinning that. There's no, because at least with booze, you can say freedom of speech. You can sure. say they're just coming to vocalize, but when they just leave. And to me, people were saying uh, at Backlash, well, you know, he got booed heavily coming in. But he really didn't get booed that heavily when he won. And I think that the reason the boos weren't that loud when he won is because the folks had gone home. Yeah, beat the traffic chants right. halfway and, and, through the match. Yeah, exactly. And you know why they happened halfway through the match? Because after those chants, they beat the traffic. Exactly. <laughs> you know? They were like, let's stop talking about it. Let's just let's we got to get out of Newark. It's late. Right. I mean, and, and that's the thing. They always say, you hear Roman say this, and it's always echoing. Uh, uh, um, it's the Cena thing, and it's echoing Vince's sentiments of, look, whether they're cheering or booing as long as they're making noise. So I see that as actually a failure. If they're booing and then... And then if that was met equally volume-wise with cheers at the end, well, then that would be a major victory. Sure. But if it's booing and then just like slightly less boos and slightly less people, now now it's a problem. Right. If it's loud boos to come in and quiet cheers to leave, it's a problem. That's you, actually— It's better than—you you should have loud boos. Mm-hmm. You don't have—if the, the volume is the same, you're fine. Right. If the reaction changes, that's a conversation to have, but the volume has to be the same. Right. Volume wasn't the same. That, that and that's the problem. And 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 Graves is star. <laughs> the other night, I think Graves said something like, uh, "Typical UK crowd booing Roman Reigns." What about just typical crowd? Why well, why are we cutting? I know. Well, he can't say that. He's got people in his ear. But I think, yeah, I think we know whose who's no, words those. Of course, were. <laughs> of course. I, but but and I'm not saying Corey Graves is. But you're just is, saying that's the, the deliverer the, the, of the message that you heard on his television. The show. message and the and the and the cutting around the booze and mm-hmm. and 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 um, putting the volume down on the booze. We're too smart for that, and 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 it's not gonna stop. Are there, so you might as well acknowledge it, play into it, and use it. Right. That's what WWE does best. And I, 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 for, for a couple of years now, I've been saying, I know, I know, they should turn them, guys, but it's never going to happen. Stop. It's John Cena. He's just going to keep going through it and smiling through the booze until eventually we have a ton of respect for him and we look at his resume and go, you know what? Roman Reigns is kind of badass. It's not going to happen because it's not the same. But, and here's the thing, too. John Cena's second was probably Randy Orton. I mean, you could make the argument Batista, but realistically, over time, like, I think Randy Orton is probably John Cena's second. Randy Orton was not Braun Strowman, right? Mm -hmm. I think that Braun Strowman is that X factor where people go, the conversation went from, yeah, I guess this is the guy, to everybody, kids included, acknowledging, going, no, I think that's the guy. Uh Uh-huh. He's bigger. He's bigger. 
Yeah. And I like him. I like him. Right. I cheer with him. I like when he yells. He's I excited. yell too. You see him throw himself into his own trophy. <laughs> that was awesome, by the way. <laughs> yeah, he I mean the shoulder tackles when Kevin Owens does a full backflip. He could run like as quick as he runs. He's yeah. amazing. Um do you have any uh dark horses in WWE right now that you're like, I'm looking at those guys or, or that guy? Uh, uh, this is not a hot take or anything. I'm excited about. I'm excited about Drew McIntyre. I hope. I, I think hope. that's yeah, yeah, yeah. I think that that's. Uh, but that's not a dark horse, and that's not interesting. Uh, oh, yeah, it's, I, I would still classify it as a dark horse. The fact that he's coupled with Dolph Ziggler, it's like, you know, Dolph Ziggler's story is kind of one of being like, yeah, that could be something, and it not being something. Yeah, I think he. So, this, they're they're using. I I. Th- Think and hope that they're using this to springboard McIntyre into stardom. I would think so too. Uh, and uh, I like that he didn't put hands on Strowman. That's a match. Like that's a singles match eventually in a year and a half. Like I, not not this SummerSlam. Uh, right. Although they might do that, but right. I mean, till it actually means something and there's a belt on the line. There, there, there's it, it's we're in the infancy stages of his push. Right. Um. Dark horses. I mean, all my dark horses come with, you know, some sort of a turn. It's like, I, I think... <laughs> he could be good, but... Yeah, Bob Brood could be good if you gave him <laughs> the Fortune 500 speeches again. Um, this isn't a hot take either or a dark horse. Um, and I know tonight I'll be like, oh my God, why didn't I think of Aiden English? But um, I I think the Undisputed Era is maybe one of the best factions out there right now. Dude, I... This podcast isn't about me putting myself over, but every now and then, when I get one really right, and when I go, like, go ahead and go back to, like, the first, probably, I think Adam Cole was a guest within the first 30 episodes or something like that. Oh, really? Like, it was way before, even the first year of this show, and the first time he was on the podcast, I said, this guy's going to WWE, this guy's the next big superstar. Just, you know, he, he conducted himself like a WWE superstar in an interview as a Ring of Honor guy. Yeah. And nobody does that. You know what I mean? And it goes a long way. And then you see him in the ring. He's a different guy than he was in the interview. He's 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 capturing people. He was working babyface. He was working heel. Like he can do it all. I, I will never say enough about Adam Cole. I think, you know, Roderick Strong being added to the group is just that extra little oh. tweak that he needed because he's amazing. And I mean, and when Bob Kyle O'Reilly is like the greatest. And when Bobby Fish comes back. Forget it's just it. going to be... But it's also so much fun. And I wonder... Ring of Honor has kind of shifted in the sense that they've almost become a vehicle for the Bullet Club. You know what yeah, I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. A little bit. And the Bullet Club... It's the bridge. Exactly. Like, I, th- I wonder if the Undisputed Era won't represent the last generation of Ring of Honor talent that ended up being the future of WWE, you know, because you go back and it's like even Cesaro and those guys, like that's Ring of Honor talent that come to WWE. There was, uh, it, it was like the Cesaro, Samoa Joe eventually got there, mm-hmm. AJ Styles, like that's Rollins, the early yeah. Ring of Honor, CM Punk. You go a little bit forward, you got Daniel Bryan, then you got Seth Rollins, Rollins right. then you got, you know, all these guys coming up from Ring of Honor. You got your Kevin Owens, your Sami Zayn's, who a rivalry that started in Ring of Honor is continuing into WWE. And the generations continue to go right into this undisputed era. And aside from maybe, like, maybe Dalton Castle ends up in WWE someday, I think Marty Skrull definitely will end up in WWE someday. Do you see the Young Bucks in there? At this point, point you know i think omega and the young bucks is a similar story in the sense that if they don't do it now and i can't imagine that they would do, do it right now. exactly they're selling ten thousand <laughs> yeah but i think that they may be hitting their peak mm-hmm. in short order Mm-hmm. Like I think, and and you know, people have said this about the Young Bucks for a long time, so I could be wrong. But I think that the Young Bucks and Omega may be hitting their peak in short order, and made a choice that they decided to do this independently, right? And maybe they'll have some kind of short run in WWE after all this is over, just kind of just building like on the fact that they're those guys, the and they NWO do. in WWE exactly. adjacent, yeah, exactly. Um, but. A year ago, it would have been a no-brainer 
but now not so much. And who knows? Maybe it's a good call. You know, maybe they would rather have the year or two that they've been having now versus the year or two that Just, Nakamura, for instance, has right. had. Although at the same time, you know, you talk about how much money the Young Bucks are making and how much money Kenny Omega is making. And that's a story because they're making it independently. AJ Styles has made a lot of money. Oh, yeah. You know what I mean? So it's like, it's not like going to WWE is a bad idea for people. No. You know what I mean? That's a narrative that I think is being misinformed. And it's like, you know, All In is this amazing accomplishment where they sold 10,000 seats in 29 minutes. It's unheard of in independent wrestling. But it's heard of in WWE. Right. It you happens on I mean? a weekly basis. Right. So it's like, so so there is that. I still, I don't think that any credit should be taken away from the Bucks or Cody. Of course. I think that All In is this spectacle like we've never seen in this world of wrestling and is, is bringing back the full picture of wrestling in the sense that we should have outlets for talent that are outside of WWE. And All In is what's starting to create this thing. You know, who knows? The potential of All In, this could be, Build a super promotion. I think that All In goes to uh, uh, the my personal theory that uh, exclusive contracts outside of WWE are wrong, and that it's bad for talent, and that it's not even great for promoters. That you should let talent go all over the place, be on every show, build a reputation, and it just makes them better. Absolutely. And it makes the promotions better. You know, I think Dalton Castle should be bringing his Ring of Honor championship to every show in the States. Like, yeah. You know, I, I, I think that that's the future of this thing. And if that's what All In is bringing, then I think that that is going to be something. And maybe that's what's more important to guys sure. like the Bucks, that they're, that they're building this bigger picture for wrestling. Exactly. I don't want to hand over my power to WWE and just... I can make the business better. Exactly. As opposed to, like, I can go and far more easily make as much, if not more, money. Like, they, it would be way easier for them to get money in WWE. Sure. I mean, they've but, been offered it already. Right. And they wouldn't have to make their own shirts, and they wouldn't have to pack up. You know, like, it would just be an easier lifestyle, but maybe they don't want that because they want to change the business, which they are doing. Yeah, there's definitely a revolution, and to, to be the leader of a revolution or to go to the place that everyone wants you to go and either be booked the right way or not, right. you know, or where they're... Where yeah, they're... It's in somebody else's control. Yeah, absolutely. And that's a tough thing. Like, I mean, that's why I think I'm one of the last big wrestling podcasts that's not on a network. Mm-hmm. Because I... Oh, yeah. I did this on my own, and I would like to keep it that way, and... You know what I mean? And that's a that's a very, very small version of this big picture. That but basically what you're saying is you are Cody and the Bucks. The, yeah. Of, this, this, of, this, we are the Bullet Club of podcasts. It's pretty cool. And, yeah, and, and, and also, being, you know, we're also a show for WWE. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, basically what we're saying with this entire podcast. This is, is the WWE and Bullet Club and Ring of Honor and New Japan of podcasts. Yes. Yeah. Having said that, guys, pro wrestling tees. <laughs> uh Slash Sam Roberts? Yeah, I think so. ProWrestlingTees.com slash Sam Roberts. All right. Yeah, there it is. Show well, Robert Schill. Skyler, yeah, that's where you can get your Show Robert Schill t-shirt. Skyler asked, and I appreciate you opening your home to Sam Roberts Wrestling Podcast, and uh, uh, I'm sure we'll get you in the uh, wonderful and vivacious Not Sam Studios soon. Uh, but in the meantime, I guess, where can people follow you, and uh, what do you want to let the wrestling audience know about? Uh uh, so you can follow me at, at Skylar Aston, just my spelling, no underscores or any hyphens. And uh, um, I have uh, Trolls on Netflix if you have kids or if you want to get you know stoned and watch it as an adult. That works uh, too. <laughs> it, it works for both ways. And I'm I about have Trolls to... on Twitter, that's it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, by, and by the way, uh, you know, I'm also about to do a, uh, a show at the uh, Kennedy Center. Uh, how to succeed in business. It's a limited engagement. Uh, I don't think there's much crossover with this audience. So show up and start chanting EC dub. <laughs> <laughs> Please heckle me during like a big monologue or something. Um, yeah. Uh, if you see me at a wrestling event, say what's up. It always oh, like that. That to me is, is cooler. When I went to, uh, I just went to uh, PWG for the first oh. time, and people are like, Skylar Austin, I listen to you on. I'm like, yeah, this is cooler than any recognition I would awesome. get for movie, <laughs> movies or television. So, I love it. Yeah. Well, thanks a lot, man. I appreciate it. My pleasure.
Here is Sam Roberts. Well, big thanks to Skylar Aston and thanks again to Tom Phillips for joining us uh, last week. That video of the Tom Phillips interview is going to be up on YouTube uh, in no time flat. By the time you're hearing this, it might actually already be available to watch at your leisure. Of course, the Corey Graves interview is also up on YouTube. All of these up at YouTube.com slash NotSam. And shout out to the guy here in L.A. at Fat Sal's who just saw me and said he listened to the Tom Phillips episode. Hey. These things happen, folks. Um, I thought it was really cool hearing Skylar Aston's story. I really didn't know that this year was Skylar's first ever time seeing WrestleMania live. You know, I, I had assumed, because he went to SummerSlam 91 when he was a kid. He was talking about that a little bit. But I guess when I knew that he was there, I had assumed that this was not his first uh, rodeo, as it were. He also, off the air, told a great story about trying to get uh, a thing going. Remember when I was at Madison Square Garden and I posted the video on my Instagram and stuff, um, seeing a WWE show, and I ended up getting into that argument with The Miz at ringside? Apparently at WrestleMania, he had a back and forth with Aiden English that, like, he was really super excited about. And it turned out the guy that was sitting with him, who Skyler had gone to the, to the guardrail at WrestleMania, specifically to talk some smack to Aiden English. And the guy with it, he told the guy, film this, I'm going to do this, and hopefully I can get this going, because Aiden English is a singer, Skylar Aston is a singer. The guy didn't film it because he was paying attention to Jinder Mahal's entrance. I mean, Skylar is still to this day pissed about it. And good for him. I don't blame him. Uh, speaking of pissed, you're not going to get pissed. You know why? Because it's time for the state of wrestling. We didn't, unfortunately, do it on Facebook this week because we're here in Los Angeles, but... We're only, we're less than an hour away from the time that this podcast should go live. Maybe it'll be a little late this week, by like 30 minutes, maybe, maybe. I don't know. It depends on how much we get to in the state of wrestling. The only way we're going to find out how much we get to in the state of wrestling is if we listen to it right now. It's now time for this week's State of Wrestling. And welcome to the State of Wrestling. Uh, A lot to talk about this week again. Not in the Not Sam studio, however, in a hotel room in Los Angeles, California. It's just as good of a place as any to talk about what, to me, I think, are the five biggest stories in the world of pro wrestling this week. Uh, We'll start with number five. And I went back and forth with whether or not we should talk about this on the podcast. Uh, I, I don't really think that we should. You know, I don't think most of you care about this that much. That's why it's number five. Um, But... It was a huge national news story involving two of the biggest names from WWE. So, you know, if we're talking about the biggest stories in wrestling of the week, technically you would have to categorize this as one of them. But I won't give it higher than number five because it's not a wrestling story in the sense that we're not talking about wrestling. It's, of course, the John Cena-Nikki Bella breakup. So John Cena was a co-host on the Today Show this week. He was doing it with Hoda and Kathy Lee. He was doing that uh, 10 o'clock hour with them. And they asked him early in the week uh, about the breakup, and much to the shock of people like uh, my wife and uh, many people out there who are very addicted to the Total Bellas and Total Divas universes, uh, he said that he was blindsided by the breakup with Nikki Bella, that Nikki broke up with him and that he still wanted to marry her and share a family with her, and that the pictures that you're seeing of him in bars are um, his social time, that from 6 p.m. to 9 p.m. every day, because he is so distraught uh, during his vacation period, which was supposed to be his honeymoon time, he never takes vacation. The fact that he has two weeks off is because this was supposed to be his honeymoon time. Between 6 and 9 p.m., he leaves the house and talks to strangers in order to get social interaction. Uh, You know... It kind of fits the Miz's uh, portrayal of him as a very rigid and regimented guy. But listen, as successful and good as John Cena is, if it takes written rules to get there, I would say keep it up. But uh, the question, and then, you know, Nikki Bella has talked about it since then, and she's also very distraught over the whole thing. And it's becoming a thing. It's becoming a bit of a storyline, and it's led a lot of people to assume that it's a work led a lot of people to say like oh so this is just a work for total bellas and they've already said that the breakup is on total bellas on the tv show now what do i think i don't 
I don't think it's a work in the traditional sense, right? I don't think that John Cena and Nikki Bella got together and said, like, okay, even though we got engaged, first of all, we both knew we were going to get engaged, and now we should break up in order to get everybody excited about the Total Bella show because if John Cena and Nikki Bella were getting married, it would get just as much press. They're giant celebrities. If John Cena were getting married, he would still be on the Today Show. They would be showing photos from the wedding. Uh, I mean, the, the the British royal wedding is getting all kinds of press. And John Cena and Nikki Bella, uh, in my opinion, are the closest thing that America has to a royal couple. But, you know, I, I in all seriousness, I think that a, a John Cena-Nikki Bella wedding would get just as much press as this breakup is getting. I mean, maybe you can extend it a little more because now you get the press for the breakup and you'll get the press for the wedding if you want to play devil's advocate like that. But I don't think that John Cena and Nikki Bella got together and said, hey, let's let's fake a breakup and we'll get all over the news because they can get on the news whenever they want for whatever they want at this point. They're giant stars. Um, but, you know, I do think that they're both trained performers. And when the red light is on, when the camera's on them, when a microphone's in their face... They're ready to take whatever's going on and use it to their advantage, you know. And I don't, I don't say that in a negative way. It's just, you know, the, the, they know that they do have a reality show. They do – there is all this stuff on the line. So I think that, that there is a thing where John Cena is deciding that, you know, what's best for business, the best way to explain this. I mean think about when you go through a breakup, right? The way you explain it to your parents – is orchestrated. You think about how you're going to explain it to your parents, right? You want to you want to explain it to them, making yourself look as positive as possible, making it seem like it's not that big of a mess, making the whole thing so that everybody around you isn't sad about it. So this is what John Cena and Nikki Bella have to do, except for the world, not just their parents. And I think that that's what you're seeing, and you're seeing it from two performers, two wrestlers that are sitting there going, okay, you know, we, we, we find ourselves... Working to an extent, you know, it's not just this is my pure truth from my heart coming off the top of my head. When the camera's on, they're working. That's what they're trained to do. And, you know, I think that they're both doing what they do. They're, 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 the breakup's real, I think. And they're knowing that they still have to promote a reality show. That's why they signed on. They're getting paid for it. They want it to continue in, on some level. And I think that that's what you're seeing. You know, you're seeing something that's not a work, but, you know, people are working because that's what people do. So that's what I think of it. Again, I, I don't, I think that, that it's more celebrity relationship news than wrestling news, so I don't think I want to spend too much longer on it, but that's that's what I thought about that. Another thing uh, that's not quite wrestling wrestling, but still very, very relevant to our discussions is story number four, and I just read it, that apparently, and this was just somebody on Twitter saying this, so it could be wrong, but the rumor is that NBC is keeping Raw. So there was a big, and NBC Universal, of course, owns the USA Network and all of that stuff. So there was a big discussion as to whether or not Monday Night Raw would go to Fox, you know, and whether... There was at one point a rumor that you'd see Monday Night Raw on Fox, the network, and SmackDown would go to Fox Sports Network. And it would be this thing where for Raw, it would be a big boost because now it's on network TV and that's a huge deal. And the trade-off is that SmackDown makes Fox Sports Network, which is struggling, a much uh, bigger destination because SmackDown is a big show. Uh, that's not happening. Apparently... Raw is uh, being kept on USA, but because uh, because it's such a big contract and the, and that they're paying WWE more money, they're not re-signing both shows. And apparently, SmackDown is going to go to the highest bidder. This is what I'm reading, and this is again just a rumor. Could be wrong, but they're saying that SmackDown is going to hit the open market. And another channel is going to be able to purchase the rights to air SmackDown. Big deal. And it could be really, really good for the brand extension. Because now you're talking about a true separation. The idea that we could have SmackDown over on the Fox Sports Network and 
Raw over on USA. Maybe we have SmackDown on the Paramount Network, the old Spike TV where uh, Raw used to run. And we have SmackDown. I mean, and we have Raw on USA. You know, I mean, you don't you don't know. Fox landed a deal uh, uh, for uh, NFL Thursday Night Football just recently, and the addition of SmackDown Live would give the network a, a potent one-two punch for live programming during the week, is what one article I'm reading right now says. Yeah, you know, I think that it could be good for another network to get SmackDown just because, uh, you know, the NBC cable channels, Sci-Fi and USA, have had a stronghold on it for so long. But I really think, I mean, just the idea, I think it's really interesting the idea that you're now in a situation where, depending on the network, maybe some households that get USA don't get the network that SmackDown's going to be on. And so you will have people who just watch Raw. I feel like if the two shows are on different channels, you're actually opening up potential for fans to have to pick one. Now, they'll never compete. They're not going to be on at the same time. But I'm just saying, like, like psychologically... I think you're more likely to watch SmackDown and Raw if they're on the same channel. They're showing commercials for each other. You know, you go to bed, you finish watching Raw, you turn off the TV, you turn it back on on Tuesday night. USA Network's already on. All right, SmackDown's on. When they're on two separate channels, I think there is a higher risk that you won't change the channel 24 hours later to watch the other show. I think there is something to that. The majority of people, of course— Changing the channel is not a big deal. But I think there are some that maybe won't want to change the channel. And I think there are even more that, depending on the network, not everybody gets Fox Sports Network. Not everybody gets uh, Paramount Network. Not, there are plenty of networks out there that could put the money up for SmackDown that people don't get. And when that happens, you're dealing with, okay, I just watch Raw, not SmackDown. And depending on the network, does SmackDown become the B show? Dep- it, 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 but it just feels like more of an independent entity if it's not on an NBC-owned cable channel. And it's going to be very different from uh, it being on sci-fi because sci-fi is still, you know, in bed with USA. They're both NBC networks. You know, the the presentation, the promotion, the all the stuff around SmackDown could be different on another network. And it really could solidify the brand split. So I think it's a good thing. Uh, and I think that the idea that Raw is getting, the WWE is getting so much money to keep Raw in USA that they want to allow SmackDown to go to the highest bidder would lead me to believe that the WWE is in a very amazing financial place. You know, the stock is tremendously high. USA is paying out the nose, apparently. To keep Raw in the air, I think that it's very, this is all very, very good news for WWE. I don't think this is a concern at all. And I think in the long run, it's good for us too because, again, I think that it creates a a cool independence for SmackDown where it really is removed. There's almost something about the fact that, like, okay, we all know WWE, we watch wrestling on Monday nights. So the idea that SmackDown is on on Tuesday nights on the same channel is almost a, I don't know, a a saying without saying, hey, this is the second show. This is the B show. Whereas when it's on another channel, SmackDown becomes the biggest show on the other channel. USA's biggest show is Raw. This other network's biggest show is SmackDown. I think it could be good. I think it could be really, really good. So, uh, and I'm an optimist. So I don't know if you like that or not, but um, that's me. That's me. I just think it could be good. Let's move on to story number three. And I'm going to do this one early just because it's so similar to a story we did last week, and that's Roman Reigns. And we talked about Roman Reigns with Skylar Aston earlier. But, you know, I just think that it's it's so odd what's going on with Roman Reigns right now. And I know people are critical of what's going on on SmackDown with AJ Styles and Nakamura. And, you know, I'm not the, I'm not, I I, I am too. But I don't think that it's befuddling. You know, it's just like some odd choices where, uh, I don't know if I would do that. That's a little odd. But it's not like what's going on with Roman Reigns where I, and, and, you know, who knows? Maybe there is a bigger plan with Roman Reigns. Maybe there is a grand scheme 
that we're just not seeing. But on Raw, for a couple of reasons, I was weirded out by what was going on with Roman Reigns. Number one, why is something with him and Jinder starting? I get that Jinder interfered in his match, but, you know, we just last week talked about how the best thing you can do with Roman Reigns is have him fight for his spot. You know, have him mad at Bobby Lashley and guys like that. So to have him call out Jinder Mahal who's lost almost every match since he's been back on Raw. You know, the the idea that he was a WWE champion on SmackDown has basically been rubbed out since he got there because he just loses all the time. You know, and his most kind of compelling thing has been staring down No Way Jose when he first got to Raw. They haven't been treating Jinder well. I I haven't been terribly happy with Jinder's treatment because I think... Jinder Mahal could come on Raw and talk about how he was mistreated when he was on Raw last time, but he went to SmackDown and he proved how good he was and have this new Jinder, you know? I mean, you could easily build to this thing where Jinder and Drew McIntyre are staring down each other and you've got that thing where it's 3MB so everybody's excited, but it's also, I I mean, I really think you could build to a pretty cool thing of a good guy Drew McIntyre and a bad guy Jinder Mahal having a pretty good set of matches. But you can only do that if Jinder Mahal is going to win matches. So the idea that he would be paired with Roman Reigns just left me like, why? I haven't been trained to care about this. You know, the idea that that Roman has, I mean, that Jinder has been losing so much leads me to believe, or leads me to believe that Jinder loses matches. Now, Roman wins matches. We just saw him beat Samoa Joe. I would say, looking at win-loss records, at the moment, in this storyline, Samoa Joe is a a more fierce opponent than Jinder Mahal is. Not the case several months ago. Jinder Mahal was WWE champion. But we're not there today, right? So already this idea, I'm like, I'm not... There's no mystery here. Roman beats Jinder every time. I've been watching for the last month. Roman beats Jinder every time. Okay? So the whole thing is weird. Now, we watch the way the story progresses over the show, and how on earth... People have been asking for a Roman Reigns heel turn. uh, I mean, for years now, but really hard since the build of WrestleMania, has been like, we need something new with this character. I feel like we saw it. I feel like, you know, there's no way to interpret what we saw other than Roman Reigns is a bully and Jinder Mahal was ready to fight even though he was in pain. The The medical doctor even said, you know, the storyline medical doctor even said on television to Jinder Mahal, you're cleared to compete to the degree to which you can handle pain. He said something, I'm paraphrasing, of course, but he said, as long as you can handle the pain, you're ready to go. And that, and Jinder didn't use that as an excuse to say, oh, well, I really can't handle this. And the doctor said, as long as I can handle it, he didn't. Instead, he headed to the ring to fight. And then Roman jumped him, blindsided him out of nowhere and threw him through a wall. He, he, he speared him through a wall after he was an already beaten man when he wasn't looking for no reason. How is Roman a, he- a, a hero on any level following that? On any level. How is there anything about that move that leads people to believe? Like, Jinder hasn't done enough to deserve that. Is he that mad that Jinder cost him the money in the bank match? Why is Roman so mad at, at Jinder for costing him the money in the bank match? We just watched Roman get two title shots, unsuccessful both times, okay? He was not, even though, you know, the well, technically Roman's feet hit the ground first and Brock's blah, blah, blah. I get that. Roman did not dominate that match. Roman was not the clear-cut winner of that match. It was not a given that had that cage not broken, had Roman hit the spear on Brock Lesnar like he intended, there was nothing about that match that led me to believe that that would be the end. So 
Roman doesn't feel robbed to me in that cage match. In the WrestleMania match, he just got beat. You know, he's somehow saying the excuse is, well, nobody told me he was re-signing. So, technically, I should have won that match. What? What are you talking about, man? That doesn't make any sense. You gave him everything you had. And then he cut your head open and beat you. So, I don't I don't know what the issue is. Like, I don't, I don't understand what his qualm is. He's gotten everything. He got his two title shots. He got a chance to qualify for money in the bank. He did all that. Like, everything was given to him. Everything's been given to him. So, I don't know what the qualm is with Roman Reigns. And I, I, I feel like he's turning heel. What else could it be? It doesn't make sense any other way. So, I think we should just take this as a heel turn. <laughs> I, I, I think... If you've been waiting for a Roman Reigns heel turn, you got it. Jinder Mahal is a good guy. Roman Reigns is a bad guy. And uh, going forward, uh, Jinder Mahal will be the hero. Maybe that we didn't want, but the hero that we deserve. And thank God for that. It's what we've been waiting for. You know, you'd say Jinder was doing a lot of very villainous stuff before this, but the, the night is always darkest before the dawn. And that's what we're dealing with with Jinder Mahal. A lot of Batman references. That is what we're dealing with with the modern-day Maharaja, Jinder Mahal. I, th I think so. How else could you possibly interpret it? If you watch the segments from Raw, I don't know how else you could possibly interpret it. Uh, let's move on to story number two. And story number two is, I guess, the week that Ronda Rousey's been having. You know, I guess... Um, 2B, I'll, get, I'll start with 2B because I'm going to go to 2A. That's the real point. But 2B is Ronda Rousey wrestled her first uh, live show uh, right before the taping of this podcast. Wednesday night, she was in uh, Europe, and she wrestled her first live event. It was a six-person tag, and her partners, I believe what it looked to me was, it was Ronda, Natty, and Ember Moon against Liv Morgan, Ruby Riot, and I think it was Mickey James. I watched a video, and I think it was Mickey James, which I don't know why Sarah Logan wouldn't have teamed with uh, the rest of the Riot squad, but it looked like Mickey James. Um, and, you know, from what I saw, she was great. You know, I think that it's, it's pretty clear that the reason Ronda has not been competing each and every week is because she's still learning, and I think that the six-person tag certainly sets her up in a beautiful way to just go in there, get the hot tag, get her spots in, and look good and, you know, be with Ember Moon and Natty, who are two of the best, that are going to, the whole team is going to look good. And really, on paper, you got Ember Moon and Natty, who are the best. The performer that we saw at WrestleMania, Ronda Rousey, is unstoppable. So you're dealing with one of the great six, uh, three-lady, six-person tag teams ever. You know, in terms of pure dominance. But the real story with Ronda Rousey is that she is getting the Raw Women's Championship match. At Money in the Bank, it's Nia Jax versus Ronda Rousey, who it was reported from, from the wonderful, beautiful, ever-so-talented Kathy Kelly, who, by the way, if you can all send her tweets and give her props for the fact that she opened Raw, that's a big deal. Kathy Kelly dear friend of mine, has been here on the podcast before, has been on the YouTube show before, was on my SiriusXM show on the reg, opened Monday Night Raw with her report from the Upfront's red carpet, and that's unbelievable. It's an amazing, amazing thing, and you guys should make sure to go out of your way and tweet congratulations to Kathy Kelly, because that is no small feat. It's a big deal. So she was on the red carpet, she was interviewing Ronda Rousey, interrupted by Nia Jax, who came over and said, yeah, well, you're not the Raw Women's Champion, and I challenge you to a match for my title. I talked to you about this when Sasha Banks was the Raw Women's Champion. I don't know what it is with these chicks and challenging people for their own titles. I will never, ever, ever, under any circumstance, unless it's like a deeply personal issue that we're hearing about, be in favor of champions challenging challengers. It makes no sense in the world, storyline-wise, why Nia Jax would challenge Ronda Rousey. If I'm Nia Jax, even if I'm a good guy, and I'm the Raw Women's Champion, and I can challenge whoever I want, 
you know, it's going to be one of the jobbers. Why not? Why would you go and challenge the person being billed as the most dangerous woman, female athlete ever? Like, 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 why would you, why would you do that? What, what's the best case scenario? Do you beat Ronda Rousey? Does that make you the champion? You already are the champion. You already are the best. You already have the championship. So I don't know why that would happen. And that always bothers me. And I get, I have no problem with doing it at the upfronts. I think that doing it at the upfronts was a genius move because it draws attention to WWE. It draws attention to the fact that they're at the upfronts. You know, that's a big deal. And it makes them look like an even bigger media company. So I, I fully support having that happen at the upfronts. But, you know, why not have Nia Jax go up, brag to Ronda Rousey about being the Raw Women's Champion and saying, like, look, Ronda, and not, she doesn't have to be a heel because clearly they don't want Nia Jax to be a heel. But just go, you know, Ronda being like, you know, I'm the baddest woman on the planet, blah, 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 I'm Rowdy Ronda, blah, 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 and have Nia Jax be like, she could say the same thing, but can you do this and lift her title up on the in the air and say, I'm the Raw Women's Champion. No offense, Ronda, but I think I'm I'm the one. I'm the one that people should be talking about here. I'm the champion. I'm the best. Nobody beats me. And Ronda then, same setup, except before Nia challenges Ronda, Ronda turns around and says, hey, I'm all for it. I think you're amazing. Keep them both faces, as I think they want to do. I think you're amazing. Why don't you put your money where your mouth is? Why don't you put the title on the line against me? Then, now that Nia Jax has been challenged, Nia Jax can say, okay, how about money in the bank? Almost as if to say, if we're going to do this, I'm going to challenge you right now while you're inexperienced. I'm not going to give you time to prepare for this. My next challenge... Is that money in the bank? Or or my next title defense is scheduled for money in the bank. Why don't you step up and take it? Huh? You want a title shot? But Ronda's got to say something about wanting a title shot before Nia does for it to make sense to me. Um, I think this is great. You know, I think that this is smart. There, There's, let, let's, you know, it doesn't make sense to use Ronda other, as anything other than main event talent. And I, and it won't. This is bigger than Ken Shamrock, you know? So, I I think that this makes perfect sense. I don't have a problem with the timing. Some people did. I don't. Uh, I do not think that Ronda Rousey is going to win the Raw Women's Championship. Uh, they've been building up this natty thing. You know, it's weird to me that there was never a payoff. I, I assumed that we were easing towards a tag match at a pay-per-view with Ronda and Natty together on a team. Apparently that's not happening at Money in the Bank. I really did think that they were going to hold off on the women's championship match until SummerSlam uh, because just Ronda wrestling at a pay-per-view would be a big enough deal. But I guess they decided, like, no, we want we want a big marquee women's match for this show. And I'm fine with it. You know, I don't have a problem with it. But I do think that instead of seeing the Natty turns on Ronda in a tag team match, I think we'll see... Natty cost Ronda the championship, whether it's via disqualification, whether it's, you know, I think it will probably be via disqualification. I don't think they're going to have Natty, like, trip Ronda Rousey and have Nia Jax pin her because I don't think that they want the visual of Nia Jax pinning her. But, you know, I think that, I think that even, even if, what I would do is I would have Natty come in and beat up Nia Jax and have it see and like let's play this out and have it seem like oh I'm here to help you and then Ron is like you just got me disqualified help me you just got me disqualified from this match and Ron, and Natty's like no I didn't mean to do that I thought you needed the help blah 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 and so Ronda loses by disqualification. I don't think she needs an undefeated streak and we just did that with Asuka. So and plus she's not wrestling that much right now. So have not have Ronda lose via disqualification because Natty got involved. Ronda forgives her, but it's the slow build towards Natty eventually completely turning on Ronda and uh, and going forward in that direction. That to me 
makes the most sense. But I guess as the weeks progress, we'll be able to talk more about that as Money in the Bank uh, approaches closer and closer and closer. The number one story of the week in the world of professional wrestling is, without a doubt, last Sunday, a press conference happening at Pro Wrestling Tees. All In being announced, StarCast lineup being announced, the whole weekend uh, of Chicago festivities, which, um, you know, I would I would recommend if you can get into StarCast, everybody goes. I've been asked many times. Unfortunately, uh, I'm not going to be uh, doing the show from StarCast. So I, I don't think I can get there that weekend. Uh, but Conrad, I've talked to Conrad, I've talked to everybody. They've been really, really cool. Uh, and I fully... I think, and I hopefully we'll get some of those guests on the show to promote it and everything, because I, I just think it's amazing what this is doing for wrestling. In 29 minutes and 46 seconds, I want to say, it was less than 30 minutes. In under 30 minutes, the 10,000-seat building that All In is being performed in was sold out. The bet's over. Cody Rhodes and the Young Bucks put together a show that has already sold 10,000 tickets. It's sold out, and that is an incredible feat. So announced, you know, we've got uh, Tessa Blanchard, Marty Skrull, the Young Bucks, Rey Mysterio has been announced for this show, uh, a whole bunch of guys. uh, But the first match announced is the NWA championship match between Nick Aldis and Cody Rhodes. I think, to me, the main event to this show is the show. The main event is look what we accomplished and look what happens in 2018 when wrestlers come together and put their talents together. We're not all competing with each other. We're putting all of our talents together and we're showing the world, look at what's going on in wrestling. It's an amazing, amazing thing. Um, I think that that's a, it's an interesting first match. I'm a little surprised because I, I, I thought that Cody would try to build some kind of a dream match or something, but I like it because we're we're really it really does a lot for the NWA. Like I can't believe what a what a pat on the back Cody is giving to Billy Corgan and Dave Lagana and the NWA by heightening the importance of the championship even more, putting it as his match at All In, probably the main event to the show, and remind making it about the title you know right now the story of that match is Cody Rhodes and the Rhodes legacy and holding the NWA championship if it's up to me I don't think Cody Rhodes should win the NWA championship at uh at all in I think a lot of people expect him to and I think that's the given like it's his show you know, Cody Rhodes wears the same championship that Dusty Rhodes wore. You know, they, they're big on the fact that they're using the same physical belt uh, to represent the NWA champion. But I think that this is similar to when a guy retires and, and he loses or, or whatever it is. At the end of the day, Cody Rhodes is put over by the success of this show. Cody Rhodes doesn't have to win a match at all in to come out of All In as the victor. He literally already is because of how successful the show already is in, in you know, two months before it's actually going down, three months before it's actually going down. So, and, and I think that if Nick Aldis were to walk out of All In with the NWA championship, it would make him and the NWA title that much more of a coveted prize. You know, I think giving things the Bullet Club rub doesn't always work long term. And I think that Ring of Honor is feeling that right now. You know, I think that that there is so Ring of Honor has so much invested in the Bullet Club guys that a lot of the attention that should be on the Ring of Honor guys isn't there. And I think that that could happen with the NWA championship. I think if Cody Rhodes is the NWA championship, the headline is still going to be Cody Rhodes, Young Bucks, Bullet Club, Elite, All In. Oh, yeah, and he's the NWA champion. It just becomes a prop at that point. As beautiful as the story is, and as much as you can then talk about the heritage, I think that you can get the heritage of that title over. You can get over how much it means to Cody because of his dad. You can do all that and then have Nick Aldis win anyway. And it's only going to make Nick Aldis a better heel. So that's what I think. But 
really congratulations to Cody Rhodes and the Young Bucks uh, and everybody involved, all the pro wrestling tees guys and Conrad and Starcast and everybody for for pulling off something huge in this world of pro wrestling. It really is an amazing thing. And it has been amazing sharing all of this time with you again this week. Don't forget to visit NotSam.com for all of your Not Sam, last professional broadcaster, Sam Roberts needs. And we will see you next week here, back on the East Coast, on Sam Roberts Wrestling Podcast. Thanks for listening. Thanks for listening. Follow at NotSam on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube. And subscribe for free to listen every week to Sam Roberts Wrestling Podcast.